let's spend a few minutes talking about the implications of building software. We've learned all these tools for managing complexity of large programs because building large programs might be something we want to do in the future. And in fact, we have a lot of people studying computer science these days explicitly for the goal of working on a software engineering project in the future as part of their career. And building software for a living or contributing to that process can be a good job. The work is interesting. Every once in a while you get to solve a recursion problem. Sometimes the work can be done remotely. And it's in high demand, which means that there are well-paying jobs out there for developing software. And some people are attracted to computer science because of those jobs. Some people are attracted because they like the material. And some because they like the idea of having a big impact on the world. And most students are some mixture of those three, with various other reasons as well. But I think it's worth pointing out that the good jobs and the social impact are very tightly coupled. The reason that companies are willing to pay a lot for a software engineer is that the software they produce can affect a lot of people and therefore create a lot of value or economic activity. The reach of modern software applications is kind of unbelievable. More than 2 billion people use Facebook regularly. And that's not the only application over a billion. YouTube, WeChat, WhatsApp, I think all have more than a billion active users in a typical month, and maybe there are more. So by building software, you can affect the lives of a reasonable fraction of all the people on the planet. Or by building more niche software, you might affect a smaller number of people. But if you build something that someone uses every day for every hour of their job, that can have a massive impact on their life. So software engineering as a field is all about making a difference in people's lives. And the thing about software that makes it so good for building large businesses is the same fact that makes it affect so many people. Once you build a software application, it's very inexpensive to distribute it to a very large number of people who might want to use it. Now, after taking a course like CS61A, where you've just solved technical problem after technical problem, you might get the impression that developing software is really mostly about problem solving. And that issues like what to build, and how to build it, and whether you should build it, might be up to somebody else who took some other course in some other department. But that turns out not to be true in practice. Instead, the people who build software tend to be primarily responsible for what gets built, how to build it, how the software behaves, and what shouldn't get built at all. Because the social implications of software applications, like their effect on people's communication, on their privacy, on their access to information, and on their happiness, tend to depend not on policies about the software, but on the software itself, how it behaves. And the people who develop the software are the ones who understand and control the behavior of the software. So if you're building something and you don't take responsibility for its social implications, meaning the impact that it has on other people's lives, then probably nobody will. Or if somebody else tries, they won't be in a position to do as good a job as you could do. So more and more we see in industry that software engineers are being asked to think about the social implications of what they build and make sure that they consider the consequences of their work instead of just solving problem after technical problem. So let's look at a few instances of where that comes into play. One right now is about privacy. There's a lot of work at the moment in trying to figure out what policies and laws should govern information privacy and information ownership of consumers 
who are using software in their daily lives. And what we hear out of tech companies is very different today than it was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, Mark Zuckerberg, the founder and CEO of Facebook, said people have really gotten comfortable not only sharing more information in different kinds, but more openly and with more people. That social norm is just something that has evolved over time. But that time frame in which it has evolved was very fast, and so technology changed how people interacted with each other, how society worked. And I'm not trying to pick on Mark Zuckerberg. He seems to have gotten a fair amount of bad press recently. But if you look over the history of his actions, he seems to care a lot about society. At one point, he committed to giving away 99% of his fortune to charity. That's pretty nice. Now, he won't be starving with only 1% left, because that's how rich people can become using technology in modern society. But he clearly has indicated both through his speech and his actions in the past that he does care about the social implications of what gets built. But caring might not be enough. Now we've reached the point that people are suggesting changes to how technology is regulated in order to deal with the fact that technology is changing society so fast, that social norms are changing, and that the amount of information that's available to third parties is radically different than it was 10 years ago. One speech I found very interesting was by Tim Cook, the current CEO of Apple, in 2018. He was addressing an international conference of government representatives and regulators, and he said, we at Apple are in full support of a comprehensive federal privacy law in the United States. There and everywhere, it should be rooted in four essential rights. In this speech, Tim Cook, who leads a company that would be regulated by such a law, is asking for the law. And complying with the law is kind of complicated certainly costs a lot of money, and restricts what the companies are allowed to do. But nonetheless, he suggested that there should be a law in the United States guaranteeing individual citizens four essential rights. First, the right to have personal data minimized. Companies should challenge themselves to de-identify customer data or not to collect it in the first place which would move away from a standard practice of just collecting all the information that you can because it's cheap to collect data and it might be useful later. Second, the right to knowledge. Users should always know what data is being collected and what it is being collected for. This is the only way to empower users to decide what collection is legitimate and what isn't. Anything less is a sham, says Tim Cook. Third, the right to access. Companies should recognize that data belongs to users, and we should all make it easy for users to get a copy of, correct, and delete their personal data. And fourth, the right to security. Security is foundational to trust and all other privacy rights. Now, people have questioned Tim Cook's motivation in making these requests. Is it to get a competitive edge? Is it to make Apple look like it's very concerned with people's data privacy as a branding ploy? Those are plausible. But I think the more plausible explanation is that the implications on privacy of all the software that individuals use these days is just too great for it not to be regulated sometime soon. And so technology companies are trying to enter into the conversation of what the regulation should look like so that they can still build the software that they think is useful for their customers, but move away from the status quo, which perhaps collects too much personal information and accidentally reveals it too often. If instead the design of new laws is just left up to regulators, it might not turn out to be as easy to implement by the companies that then have to comply with the law. And Apple is not the only technology company that's taken a similar stance. In the last year, several others have followed suit. And I think you can expect that a lot of the people who joined large technology companies 
for the purpose of just building software, will instead be involved in this other interesting process of figuring out what rules should be in place around what software can do, especially related to privacy. But privacy isn't really going to be affected most by laws and regulations. It's mostly affected by software design itself. How the software behaves includes whether or not it's secure, so is stuff that's supposed to be private stay private, but also there's the user interface, which is supposed to let the user control some of what's shared and what's not. If it's hard to use, confusing, unintuitive, then massive privacy violations can occur, not because there's some security hole in the software, but because users don't understand what they're doing with it. And this is a persistent source of privacy breaches. People send messages to unintended recipients or allow access to people that they didn't really want to allow access to just because they made a mistake using the software. One of the lighter examples of this is this headline, Grandmas Keep Accidentally Tagging Themselves as Grandmaster Flash on Facebook. Here are some examples. Happy birthday, Cassie and Jesse. It's hard to believe 20 years have gone by so fast. Wish we could be their love, Grandpa and Grandmaster Flash. Which happens because if you take Grandma, then it auto-completes to Grandmaster Flash. And that means that Grandmaster Flash is getting tagged as mentioned in this post. And if he wanted, he could like it or read about Cassie and Jesse's birthday. Happy be dat Jaden. Have a great day. Your card has been mailed. Love you, Grandmaster Flash. So the point of this example is that the way in which software is designed affects its privacy implications. And that's not a policy issue at all. That's entirely up to the software developers who figure out what the behavior of the software is. And if you don't think about the implications carefully, you might never come up with the fact that grandmas are going to be tagging a musician instead of just writing a nice note to their grandkids.